Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us in any time zone that you're in. We really appreciate your time today. Today, we have the amazing Ted Pattinson from Microsoft. He's a program manager with the Power BI team, and he leads this Dev Camp series. We also have Daniel Zayner, our producer, who will be uh, on standby here running this uh, fabulous call. My name is Kelly Kay. I'm the Community Engagement Lead for Power BI. And today, Ted is going to take us through his Power BI Dev Camp. I think it's session seven or six. Is that right, um, Ted? This is session eight. This is session eight. Okay, great. Oh. Session eight. So take it away, Ted. Hello, everyone. Welcome to uh, Power BI Dev Camp for our monthly uh, discussion. We're going to talk about M programming today. Just a uh, couple quick um, things I wanted to point out. Uh, one is we have a portal for uh, Power BI Dev Camp. I just put something inside there, you know. But we have a page for each of these sessions, and we have some particular uh, links that you could, uh, you know, basically get to. Uh, for instance, if I go ahead and click on here. Let's see if PowerPoint will let me get out here. And then once we get here, if I go to today's session, um, someone uh, took exception with the word warrior in my um, title. So I've changed it to intro to M programming. So it's very friendly for everybody. Uh, let's go here. And, you know, if you go to the session, you know, here you can download the PowerPoint slides. There's a couple of PBIX files that I'm going to show during the session. You know, so I just kind of wanted to give everyone a quick way to uh, get at those things. Okay, now what we're going to look at, you know, is basically programming with this programming language called M. So we'll do a little bit of background first. You know, so everything is built on top of this, uh, this technology that Microsoft has called Power Query. And at the base, you know, of this technology is something called the Power Query Mashup Engine. That's the thing that executes your query. Now, what's really neat about this mashup engine is that it's very flexible. You can use a tool like Power Query and not know much about ETL, but still you know, be able just to kind of figure out how to do some pretty neat magic as far as doing the extraction transform load logic uh, and put it into a Power BI data set. You know, you'll see that we could also use the exact same language and tool set to to take data and push it into a data flow. Uh, and it basically works in Power BI Desktop. It works in the Power BI service. It will basically sometimes run on a gateway and it can also run inside of Excel. You know, so the Power Query Mashup Engine you know, is everywhere. Now, what you're probably familiar with doing is working with Power Query just in the regular Power Query editor window. So what we're gonna look at today you know, is a little bit more under the covers. So note that in the Power Query editor window, you know, you can turn on and off this formula bar. You know, so for instance, let's say that I go over here to one of the samples that I'm going to show today, and I go up to the query editor window and I go to one of my queries. You know, and what we can see here is that there's the formula bar. You know, if you don't see it, you know, it's just something that you can uh, turn on and off. And we turn it off if we're afraid of M code and never want to see it. If we're embracing M code, and that's probably the reason you're here today, uh, you know, we're definitely going to turn that on. Now, when you use Power Query as a general user, you know, you basically do an operation by clicking a button or right-clicking a column and choosing something. And what gets created is what we call a step. So every query is just basically a sequential list of these steps that get processed in order. Now, another thing about queries, because Quite often when you get involved with a project, they can get a little bit messy if you kind of leave them all at the same level. You know, so if you kind of look at this example right here, you know, here's something where when you create a query, you know, you're able to take it and move it into a group. You know, so basically structuring your queries, you know, in these groups, you know, can really help out. Okay, just wanted to say in case you've never seen that, some of the examples are going to use that. Now let's get into the M programming language. You know, the first time that many Power BI desktop uh, report builders and data set builders encounter the M programming language is when they want to go and create a conditional column, you know, inside the query editor. And now I have an if then else statement. And what language is that in? You know, that's in this language called M. Now we can also get into the advanced query editor. 
You know, so we're going to spend quite a bit of time uh, there. You know, and if we look at the query editor today, you know, let's go back here and, you know, let's take one of my uh, particular queries. Uh, and with that particular query, I'll go into the advanced editor. The advanced editor used to be just a text box. You know, so it didn't really have any smarts. But over the um, you know last couple of years, they put color coding and IntelliSense in here. You know, and it's a much better experience uh, than it used to be. You know, as far as being able to work, uh, you know, with the M code directly in Power BI Desktop. Now, why should you learn M programming? Yeah, you know, and basically, it's to accomplish things that you can't do in the query editor alone. You know, so being able to create a query function perform calculations across rows. If I want to create a query on a SharePoint list, and I find out that the people who are main to the SharePoint list keep deleting it and recreating it with the same name, but the GUID changes. And so I just want my query to have a dependency on the name of the list, not the GUID. You know, so that would be, you know, another situation where you have to kind of find yourself, you know, going into the M code. Now, another big benefit, you know, one of the problems that, you know, we have, and it's taking us a while to address, is that a PBIX file is really just a big black box, you know, as far as versioning goes. So if you want to version queries independently, you know, you can simply take this uh, code, put it in a, uh, you know, myquery.m extension, and then you can check it into source code. You know, so just kind of having the golden copy, you know, of your queries, you know, might be another motivation, you know, and then you could basically just pull that logic out and copy and paste it, you know, into a new query. Yeah, you know, and just note that if I have a query, you know, let's go back here one more time, and let's say that I go to the advanced editor window and I copy that. You know, I can go, you know, in this project or in another project. You know, let's go back here and say I want a new source. I want a blank query, and I can simply open up the advanced editor and I can copy and paste, you know, a query across, you know. And as long as, you know, you're going from one project to another, you know, if this query depended on other queries, you didn't bring those, it would fail. You know, but it, that get, kind of gives you a way, you know, it's a lot of, you know, click, copy and paste, you know, but it does give you a way to kind of move queries, you know, from one project uh, to another. Okay, now, one of the things that I kind of like to see is that there are so many things that you can do, you know, if you start writing the M code. Okay, this is just a gratuitous picture I created years ago, uh, you know, when I uh, created this, uh, this session for the first time. You know, but the idea is, uh, you know, you're really able to do some pretty neat things. Hopefully, we see some of those. Also, I have to point out that there is one person in our industry, Chris Webb. I'm very lucky in that I get to work on the Power BI CAT team with him. Uh, and he is everyone's authority on Power Query and writing M code. You know, so if you go look at his blog, he's got 50 amazing blog posts uh, that go so much further, you know, into M than anyone else has ever been able to do. You know, so once again, if you're serious about Power Query, this is the blog you need. Okay, now the demos that I'm going to be showing as we go through this hour, you know, include uh, this query design demo right here. Let me kind of show one neat thing about query design. You know, a lot of times, it becomes you know, creativity. So let's say that you import data, but when your boss looks at a report, you know, she wants to see when was this data refreshed. So there's this common trick that we use, and you can see that this is not a very complicated query. You know, let's take date time, fix local time. Now, when I see that time in the Power BI service, it's gonna be Greenwich Mean Time. So I'm going to push it back five hours so it shows East Coast time. You know, but the idea is that you know now we have just a query that runs itself and basically gives us a timestamp of when you know the data was refreshed. If I go ahead and close this up, you know now we kind of go back uh, over to the report itself. Uh, you know, one of the things that we can see here, you know, is that now we can kind of put a you know a timestamp uh, in front of the user. You know, once again, just by coming up with some kind of ingenious way, you know, to use M, you know, inside of some particular example. Okay, now let's go through the M programming language fundamentals. You know, so M is a functional language. And what that really means is 
lines of M code do not perform operations. You know, they basically evaluate something. You know, so it's really evaluation. And what you're going to see is that one step can't be evaluated until a previous step is evaluated. So M doesn't really support changing data. You know, it works in terms of, um, you know, immutable data structures. And the idea is that when you're going down a query, you know, you continue to build a new set of variables. Okay, now every query, you know, has a single value it returns of a particular type. And we're going to get more into that. Now, other things to note is M is, you know, case sensitive. You know, so, you know, it's not VB script, you know, it's more like C sharp. Uh, it's all about writing expressions and figuring out, you know, how to write an expression that evaluates to what you want. Now, query expressions can reference other queries by name. You know, so here's an example where if I create query one, and a query could just return, you know, basically a string value. So let's go back uh, here. Now, here's the other demo. This one is called Intro to M Programming. And note that when you get to the main form window, there's not going to be anything there. You, you got to go and click on Transform Data and get to this window, you know, before it's going to be uh, interesting. But let's look down at all these queries that I'm going to be demoing through. And you kind of see that this one has ABC, meaning this query returns a string. You know, what does a query look like? You know, if it's going to return a string, you know, basically you can just see that it has values and returns back inside there. Now, let's kind of talk about one of the first things you need to get your head around, which is the let statement. Okay, a let statement, you know, is a single expression that returns a single value. You know, but within the let block, there's a lot going on. You know, so each line in the let block, you know, you can think represents a separate expression, which is then assigned to a variable. Okay, now you'll see that every single line in a let block, except for the last one, has to have a comma behind it. You know, so let's go to a regular query right here uh, and just kind of make some uh, comments. Let's say that we go to uh, sales running total. And let's go ahead and open that up. And notice that there is a comma here, but there's not a comma here. So what happens if I remove that comma? You know, basically, you got an error. Let's go ahead back here uh, and fix that. And now let's go ahead and put one at the end. And now we're going to get the same thing. You know, so it's all about you know making sure that every single line, you know, except for the very last line, uh, has a comma behind it. And that's how we start structuring things. You know, and now all of a sudden things start working again. Now, the next thing I want to do is let's talk about variable names. And what you're going to see is, first of all, we can add comments. So if you want to add comments, comments are ignored by the by the mashup engine, you know, but are there so later someone can go back and you know see what you were trying to do. Uh, also, note that we have variables. And if you have a space in your variable name, your M code becomes a lot more ugly. And you know what you can see here is, you know, let's go ahead and you know look at one of these uh, particular uh, variables right here. Uh, and if I now go back here and we look at the advanced editor, that looks great. You know what would happen if I come back here and I'll go ahead and rename. And we'll go ahead and rename that. And now what you can see is it had to make this variable a lot more ugly. So what you can see is that the steps are your variable names. And if you put spaces in your step names, it makes the applied steps thing look better. Yeah, but it makes the uh, you know M code look a lot worse. Yeah, you know, so I'm kind of in a habit of after I've created a query, you know, to basically go back through that query. Uh, let's see if I can kind of find one here. You know, you can kind of see all my queries. Um, you know, I have just this need to kind of take the spaces out. So I come back here and let's go back to the advanced editor. And you can see it's a little bit ugly there, but now I'm going to go back here. And once again, you know, this is a preference on my part, but I don't really care about spaces here. I'm much more concerned, you know, with the M code, you know, 
being more straight ahead, easier to deal with. You know, so once again, that's a good reason to kind of avoid spaces uh, in the names of your steps. Now, let's look at this basic concept. So let's say this is a query. What's going to happen? The first thing that happens is the mashup engine tries to evaluate what's at the very bottom after the in keyword. And so as it evaluates this, it then has to evaluate its expression. And to evaluate that expression, we have to evaluate something before. We have to then evaluate var two and var one. So there's this triggering you know, of expressions uh, where you know, as this runs, it kind of starts from the bottom up, but then you know, the evaluation goes var one, var two, var three output. Now, also note that what would happen if you had something like this? You know, will this M code work? You know, so if I come back over here and we kind of saw the uh, first one, you know, and that first one, you know, looks fine. Well, let's go to this one right here. Uh, and inside of this, we'll go backwards. And so the M mark, the, the mashup engine is fine. But what happens when you do this is it confuses the applied steps. You know, so the Power Query can't, designer, you know, can't really deal with that. You know, if you were writing M code by, um, you know, machine or by hand and not dealing with a designer, this would be fine. But, you know, in general, we should avoid that, you know, just because we like the designer being able to kind of show us the steps and the logical progression. Okay, now let's go oh, into oh, cool. the... Hey, Ted, um, just wanted to jump in quickly um, before we go on to the next section. We do have a couple of questions here. Um, and is that is it okay if we just uh, answer a couple of those from the previous section? Okay, yeah, I okay. can see some of these questions here. Yeah, we've uh, got, um, would it be make sense to expose the internal row numbers so developers would not necessarily have to add index columns? That's uh, one question from Lutz. Okay, I'm going to answer that when I get to index, which I'm going to okay. get to in a little bit. Excellent. And then the next, there? yeah, is there a way for us to hide M functions that are not supported on gateways? Like, um, and he put a, a SQL database um, uh, link there. Yeah, so I think is, can we do something in Power BI Desktop, flick a switch so I can't write, you know, code that would not run the Power BI service or the gateway? And unfortunately, there's really not any type of, um, you know, robust enforcement in the tool. You know, it really has to be you writing the queries, testing them in Power BI Desktop, then pushing them to the service, you know, and seeing if they run there or not. Okay. And then Chrissy um, G asks, is it also possible to run M queries in DAX Studio along with the query editor, or is it the best practice to run them in the query editor, TIA? I would run them in the <laughs> query editor. Um, okay. So that's a yes. Yeah. Yeah, well, you wanted. I I don't really know that. I know I've run DAX Studio uh, DAX functions. I just don't know if it also supports M code. So I just I can't answer that question because I don't know. No worries. And Danny, um, if you'd like to take the base player conversation onto uh, Ted's personal uh, Twitter, feel free. <laughs> sure. He sees okay. your base star in the background. Thanks. Now let's get into some of the uh, type systems here. Yeah, you know, so you can see that there are types that are built in, uh, and in addition, we have complex types that we want to take a look at, you know, in this session. You know, what is the list type, record type, table type, or function type? You can also define user-defined types, which gets to be, you know, a very uh, robust way you know, to pull data back, you know, especially when your data files sometimes have up to 12 columns, but sometimes they don't have that many columns, or it can't automatically interpret the type of column as it's ingesting the data. So we'll see some examples of those. You know, so here's just some examples of if you're writing M code and you assign var one, you know, that's a number, true, false, Boolean values, you have text values, and then there's null. Okay, now if I wanted to create a list, you know, you can think of it as an array. You, know, you can see we have the uh, curly braces right here. And, you know, in addition to the uh, curly braces, you know, that we have here on the list, you know, how do we access something inside the list? Uh, you use the same curly braces. You know, other languages use square brackets or parentheses that just M code, you know, uses this to work, you know, to basically dig into the array and get something, you know, out of it. 
We also can create records. And you can kind of see this record syntax of being able to you know, put the square brackets at the end uh, and the beginning, and then just have fields and values. You can also see that if you have a record and you wanted to pull a field value out, you know, that's the syntax right here. Okay, now we're gonna look a lot more at tables. You know, here's kind of just some simple syntax to get started with a table. Note that many of the functions that we have in the language are strings to us because they start with a pound sign, but you get used to that. You know, here's a quick example of a function. And when you define a function, you define a parameter list, you know, of one or more parameters. Uh, and then you define, you know, the function body, how it evaluates. Okay, now let's look at some of these in a little bit more uh, depth. You know, here's just uh, for your reference, if I want to create a time or a date and either hard code it or dynamically build it in M code, you know, we have these date and time functions. How about catching errors? You know, this gets to be a really important one. So let's say that you have this date. And what I wanted to kind of demonstrate here is, you know, we have some dates over here. Um, and with these particular uh, dates, you know, what you can see is, you know, February 30th, hey, that's not a date. Uh, you know, Cinco de Mayo, I can't figure that out. So let's say we kind of take this approach of, you know, the first one. And what you can see in the first one is that we're just saying, you know, take the raw date and convert that into a date. And we're getting errors here. You know, however, if we look at the second one, and now we're gonna have a try block uh, where get the date, if there's an error, just leave it null. You know, so you can kind of see the difference, you know, between uh, date one, you know, where I didn't have the error checking uh, and date two, you know, where I did. You know, so the try otherwise, you know, is basically the main way that you're gonna deal with uh, catching errors. Okay, so let's move on now. And we're gonna look at some of the richer data structures. You know, so if you're going to start programming M, this is definitely a very important part to understand. And Let's... hey, um, hey uh, Ted, we do have a couple of questions. Sorry uh, for interrupting here, but we do have um, a couple of questions. And one is, should we write output or var4 at the end of the hello world code? Either one will, either one will work fine. Okay. And then do you have a guide on some best practices for writing direct query code? And if so, can you put the link in the chat for us? Uh, I do not. I can't think of any. Um, you know, most of what we're looking here is going to work with import. Okay. Uh, you know, drum, but your M code, you know, is very limited in direct query. In okay. fact, all you're able to do is write M code that they have to eventually translate into SQL that runs at runtime. You know, so once again, it's a lot uh, trickier to you know to work with M code if you're not using import mode, if you're using direct query mode. Okay, um, yeah, because uh, thanks Amit, for that question. And then uh, Danny said, would like to know your thoughts on when to use a merge query versus join in data models. Um, generally join is when you're, um, well, a merge query is a join query, you know, basically. Uh, merging is generally done when you have, you know, a table with a primary key, a table with a foreign key, and you want to merge them together. So I'm not really sure what the difference is between those. Okay. okay, thanks so much, Ted. I just wanted to stop after every Okay, question. you just come in and get the questions out of me when you need to, you know how okay. to do it. <laughs> okay, so Thank you. with lists, you can see that if I wanted to create a list and grab data out of it, you know, there's syntax, you know, for being able to do that. Look down here at the bottom. Let's say that you've created this array and the elements go zero, one, and two. So if you say rat pack four, that's basically going to be an error, and it's out of range error. However, look at this cool syntax. If I put a little question mark afterwards, this is something to say, if there is an error because it's out of context, just return a null value. You know, so once again, it's an important part when you're writing your M code to be able to do that. Now, here's something that Chris Webb came up with, and I steal from him. But the idea is, you know, let's say that you have people putting comments on your website. And what you want to do is you want to harvest these comments and show them, but they keep putting characters you don't want. So your first approach was to, you know, do find and replace. You know, if you find this character, you know, replace it, you know, with a blank string. However, they keep coming up every week with new things. So let's change our philosophy. You know, instead of assigning what to 
omit character wise, let's go ahead and define a list of characters that we will accept. So right here, you can kind of see here's some kind of cool M code to create a list. Notice this little dot dot syntax. So the first set is uppercase A through Z and then lowercase A through Z. And now we need the digits zero through nine, but we need to kind of not have them still be numeric. We have to kind of convert them to text. We're gonna take a couple other characters. You know, look at the ampersand here. When you have lists, you can just kind of put them into characters allowed. Now let's take our input and allowed cars. And the idea is that any character that's not in one of those four sets, you know, is gonna be stripped out of the text. You know, so once again, you can see that, you know, if you get down and dirty with the M code, there's some pretty neat things that you can do in terms of data cleansing. Now let's look at records. Now you're probably not gonna write code that does this because you're just going to query a database and it's gonna give you back a table structure that has records. But just to kind of see things, you know, in a conceptual way, you know, I've created these three different records here and you can see that when it's time to access a record, you know, you can basically access it by the record name and then the field name in the square brackets. Now, one of the things about records is quite often, if you're gonna make a call, you know, to one of the functions that's part of the M function library, they quite often make you create a record, you know, for the particular uh, parameter value. Now, there is uh, request headers here. So the idea is that when I use web.content, you know, I want the accept header to go out. So the first thing I do, you know, is I create a request header record. And now here are the two different request headers. Note that because this one, you know, has the uh, hyphen, you know, we've got to use the pound sign right here, you know, but now what we're going to do is we're going to create a second record. And now what you'll see is the request headers record is nested in the options record, you know, which is ultimately passed when we call web.contents. You know, so once again, quite often, whether you want to deal with records or not, uh, you know, you're forced to because you have to create one to make a function call. Now, you see a couple examples here, but the ampersand is very flexible. You know, we call it the combination operator because it works with text. You know, it works with lists and it even works to merge records together. You know, so it's a very flexible uh, thing. So now what we want to do is let's look at creating a table. So there is a table dot from records. And one of the things that I could do is I could create this list of records. You, know, you can kind of see that after table from records open paren, we open a curly brace and that's closed at the end. You know, so that is a list. What's inside the list? A whole bunch of records. So you can create a table from a list of records. Now, one thing about this is that, look at the A, B, C, one, two, three. Your brain should immediately tell you bad, bad, bad. So what we'd like to do is we'd like to, you know, make sure things are strongly typed. Now, here's another example. Look at this top line of code. Type, first name equals text, last name equals text. So you're really defining the schema for a record. Now, I can also down here, you know, you can kind of see that we have table, uh, type table. And so kind of here's the type for a record and that's kind of inside there. Now, what can we do with that? Let's look at this example right here. So one of the things that we could do is we could create the table first. And once we've created the table and we've strongly typed the columns, you know, then we could basically uh, add in uh, content. Okay. Because what you can see here is here's the table function. Now here's my type, and that's gonna kind of strongly type my columns right here. And then after that, well, here come the records. You know, another common scenario that we see this used is that there's some Excel workbook that's posted uh, that we have to go pull data out of. And it usually has 12 columns, but sometimes it comes in and only has nine columns. And so the query just decides what columns are gonna be there by looking at the Excel file. And then when we get to a second file and we're trying to append, it breaks because three of the columns aren't there. You know, so defining columns and strongly typing them and then appending data from a data source, you know, into that becomes a very common strategy. Let's look at something else that's neat. So let's say I wanna perform calculations across rows. I think someone had a question 
uh, about this, uh, you know, about the index. So what I'd like to do is have a sales running total. So here's our starting point. And so note that if I go to add column and we go ahead and add a index column inside here, it simply adds an index column. Now I've already done that. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, remove what I've just done. But now the trick is that if you add an index column, every single row is numbered and that can benefit. So let's go back and take a look at this right here and kind of see that because we have these numbers, we can now write M expressions to get a running total as we go down. You know, so back here, the way it works is that you have an index number. And so we're gonna assume index is zero. So we're gonna have a list range. I want all the records, you know, starting at zero and coming up all the way to where I am. And then we'll say list.sum. You know, so once again, if you want to perform calculations across rows and common things are that you just want to look at the previous row and see if you're up or down or running totals. You know, I know that a lot of this, you know, would be better accomplished by DAX code than M code in many scenarios. You know, but there are scenarios where you're basically running a query and then you basically just want to stop the query once you hit a certain number. You know, so digging for data, you know, this can be a, an effective way to kind of build a running total, you know, so that you know uh, when you can stop pulling data back. Okay, now another thing we're going to look at is the each keyword. So this takes a little bit of conceptual explanation here. So many of the functions that we would like to call, and in particular, um, the one that we're looking at here uh, is the table row here. Okay, sorry for my drawing problems here. Uh, and the idea is that the first thing takes a table, the second thing takes a function with one parameter. Now, you can tell your friend that you have a function with one parameter, but instead, if you tell your you know, friend, I have a unary function, they'll be like, oh, that sounds really cool. Just a function with one parameter. So the idea is when you call select rows, it wants you to pass a function that takes a row, and then you're gonna look at that row and make an evaluation of whether it should be included or excluded from the resulting um, you know, evaluation. So instead of using this syntax, you know, which is completely valid, what they decided to do you know, is to basically give us the each keyword. And the idea of the each keyword is it kind of simulates this part right here. And when I use the each keyword, this is a function, but you don't have to worry about the parameter. The parameter has this name of underscore. You know, So the idea is that when you say underscore, it is the record, and then you basically ask for a field. Now, one of the things that they decided is that when your unary function is looking at a record, they decided to make it so that you can include the underscore or you could just include a field name. You know, so each one works just fine. Now, there's one case that I want to point out that's a little bit tricky, and that is, let's say that I have a unary function. Okay, and here's the unary function that we have down here, each to upper. However, the thing I'm looking at is not a list of records, it is a list of strings. So if it's not an underlying record, and I don't want to pull out a field from a record, I just want to pull the thing out, you know, you can kind of see that here, you know, there is the underscore, you know, right here. Um, you know, so once again, that's, you know, the way that the each syntax works. Okay, one little gratuitous example here, you know, let's say that I want to, uh, you know, generate a list from scratch. You know, so list generate, you have a function that takes no parameters, but returns value for the first one. You know, then I'm able to say, uh, you know, let's create a list, you know, that starts at one and goes to 10. You know, so this would be the basis if you wanted to create something like a uh, date table, you know, using Power Query instead of DAX or instead of in your database, you know, it's completely capable, you know, of generating lists, you know, with advanced logic. Okay, so any questions for me, Kelly? Yes, we do. Now we I'm do. coming back to you for the questions. <laughs> yes, we do. Um, is there, um, is it also possible 
to put evaluate uh, parentheses doesn't have a hard to understand environment constraint. So is it possible to have a workaround so it can be used more freely? So the expression dot evaluate in parentheses. Oh, I'm really not sure what that is. Okay. It's yeah, maybe I can, we can look at that question and I can try to answer yeah, it later. Look, but at look, this point. You, yeah, Lutz, can you add some more context to that? And then recursive functions run into memory issues quickly when pulling pages from API data sources. Is there really no way to have global variables? Um, no, I mean, you can't have a global variable. Um, you could have a query you know, that runs and returns a value and have other queries uh, look at that, you know, but recursion, you know, is, you know, and for those of you who are not sure, recursion is what a function calls itself. You know, so if you're doing something like writing code to enumerate through a folder structure and find all the files and child folders, you know, it would be a technique for that. But, you know, depending on your data source, you know, everything has to be loaded in memory at one point. Um, you know, so recursion will only go as, as far as the memory that you have available. You know, but it is, you know, it is possible, but very tricky to use compared to like using it in a language like C sharp. Okay. okay. So let's look at query folding. Now, the idea of query folding is that you want the Power Query mashup engine, you know, to be as efficient as possible. So the mashup engine will push work back to the data source, meaning that if I have 100,000 records, I don't want to pull all the records to where the mashup engine is and then filter for just the customers in Rhode Island. I want to send the where clause to the back end or I want to send the order by clause to the back end. You know, so query folding is all about writing queries so the mashup engine, you know, can, when it calls to a database, it can add the where clause. It can select just the columns we need, maybe even rename columns, you know, maybe tell the database, you know, to do the sorting so we don't have to in the mashup engine. So query folding is mainly supported for relational databases, uh, tabular and multidimensional databases. And also if you're calling to OData web services, you know, that also supports some level of query folding, you know, but basically whatever connector you're using supports query folding or it doesn't. You know, and that's something where typically it's relational databases or OData. Now, what happens when the data source doesn't support query folding? It's not as efficient. It's got to bring all the data back and then do all that work, you know, wherever the mashup engine is running. Now, what affects whether query folding occurs? So definitely the way you structure your M code. Also, privacy levels, you know, of the data source and also native query execution. So let's look at this. Imagine that I have this particular uh, query. And so notice that I go to a database and then I filter the rows, I select the columns that I want. Maybe I'll even rename the columns. And you know what happens is that the mashup engine is smart enough you know, to take everything you want there and basically you know, put the logic for getting back the data just as you've asked for it you know, in a single SQL statement. However, you have to keep things like the table select rows and table select columns very close to the source. Because if you put some steps in the middle where it needs all the data, it's not going to be able to do the query folding. OK, you can also use something like the SQL um, uh, performance monitor you know, to look at things. Now, if you're using native queries, so here's an example of executing a query and, you know, here, you know, on the back end, you know, what you'll see, uh, you know, as we say, query equals SQL, as opposed to up here, you know, where, uh, you know, we have query equals item. You know, so here, if you want a table, it's item equals customers, and it generates all the SQL we need. Over here, you know, with query equals SQL, the idea is that it's not going to do query folding for you. Now, on the other hand, you probably don't need query folding if you're able to write a SQL statement because you're going to have the where clause and order by clause inside there. Now, when I started researching or kind of preparing for the talk this week, I thought this slide would end the topic. But this weekend, I was reading our good friend Chris Webb. And so one of the things that they've done now is they've introduced the ability to run a native query and to basically also get query folding. 
you know, but unless you use this special technique right here, uh, you know, you're not going to get any query folding. Now, questions? Yes, we do. We have um, an updated question here. Um, Lutz said the Salesforce Objects Connector supports limited query folding. It produces the appropriate um, SOQL when the developer applies filters. So it would be fantastic if we could write our own custom SOQL. That's right. And I just don't know enough specifics about the Salesforce connectors to be able to comment on that. You know, once again, you know, whether query folding is supported to any degree and how it works, you know, is really a characteristic of the underlying connector. You know, so you can't really make general rules across connectors, uh, you know, as far as how query folding is going to work. And, uh, you know, using that special query language for Salesforce would be great if their connector allows it. But uh, sorry, I just don't know the, the details of that. Okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, now, when you start working with M, you know, one of the things that you'll want to do, uh, you know, is basically figure out what are the functions that we can uh, call. So, what I'm going to do here is, let's say that, uh, uh, here's a reference to the function library inside, and there's just tons and tons of uh, functions inside there. In fact, let me kind of come back here for one second. Um, okay, this is not the way you should do a PowerPoint presentation, uh, but what I'm going to do is let's go ahead and just uh, follow this down here. Just I kind of wanted to show you this resource. You know, what do you want to use? Uh, you know, I want to use one of these uh, particular functions that does this or that. You know, so if I go look at things like, uh, you know, the um, list function values, splitter tables, um, you know, so once again, this gives you just a really good exhaustive list of, you know, all the different functions uh, that are available. Now, what I want to look at in this next section is um, let's compare two different functions. And one is going to be using O data. Okay, so let's say that I have this uh, website right here. And so if I go to uh, HTTP uh, and subliminal uh, systems uh, dot com uh, and then slash uh, API slash customers, you know, I can basically get data back. Okay, now what we could do is, you know, I could go into the query tool and I could say, you know, I would like to get this uh, data inside here. And now this, since it's going to O data, O data has a discovery mechanism, you know, where now Power Query is kind of looking at the table and figuring out what it is. And now I can basically bring it in. So what I want to do is I want to kind of compare two different approaches. So the first one is going to be O data. And if we kind of look at this uh, O data uh, example right here, you know, let me go back to uh, view and open this up. You know, it basically is able to get this and then go through and deal with the data. Now, the problem uh, with O data is that at runtime, it has to make metadata calls to basically get the metadata, and that makes a second call. So some people, instead of using O data, you know, would rather use uh, working with web contents directly. Now, let's go back here. You know, so here's web contents. And what I'm going to do, is let's take this, and I'm going to go ahead and duplicate it. So I can kind of make a, a point inside here. Uh, in fact, down here, if we kind of take a look at this um, inside here, what we're going to do is we're going to create source. And so because this is kind of a RESTful web service, I'm going to put together the URL. So I don't need query folding. Web contents does not support query folding. But the idea is that you could create a URL, especially an OData URL that uses things like dollar sign select and dollar sign filter. And now we're going to get our data back. OK, now let's go back here. And what I'm going to do is let's go ahead and delete everything after this. So I can kind of, so 
let's say that we've used web dot content, you know, and we've gotten. Um, okay, I have messed that up by not saying delete until end. Okay, so now where would we want to be? You know, so you know, here's this point, um, you know, where with that particular source, uh, and now we have this particular record. Okay, I'm going to do the demo one more time. Forgive me. Okay, and now JSON document. That's what we want. So what's going to happen? Let me go ahead and delete this now. Is that when you use um, when you use the web dot contents, and you have basically um, <clears throat> you know a URL comes back, or you have a JSON document comes back. Power Query doesn't really know the structure. So while it's more efficient, it's going to be a little harder to deal with because now I have this list. What is it? It's a list of records. And once I get to the list of records, now we're going to go to table. And now that I've gone to table, you know, I can go ahead and you know expand the columns and then you know go through and set the column names here. You know, so one of the things that I was trying to show is that this is a harder thing to create, but it can be more efficient because it's able to pull all the data back, you know, in a single call, you know, as opposed to the other one. You know, let's see if I can uh, demo this a little bit more. Um, if um, I come back here and let's bring this up and Okay, give me one more second as I demo this to try to demo it correctly and rename that just to uh, web contents. Uh, and now that we've done that, let's go ahead and enable load. And now we'll go ahead and close. Okay, and so what I wanted to do is we'll bring up this tool Fiddler. Okay, if you don't know about Fiddler, it's definitely a fun tool for developers. You know, but the idea is uh, if I come back here and we look at the O data feed, uh, and so you know now what I want to do is refresh the data. You know what we can see here is look at all these calls that O data is making. In fact, it looks at different metadata endpoints that aren't even supported, and when those fail, it finally comes back here. You know, and now if I compare that, you know, to uh, a call to web contents, boom, one quick call across the network. You know, so once again, uh, the O data, you know, connector comes with a price. You know, it's nice in the fact that it figures out what the shape of the data is for you. Uh, but those extra calls, you know, if you're looking to uh, optimize things, you know, might be helpful. Okay, two more topics. Let's roll through. Is it okay, Kelly? If we kind of roll through yeah, and take no. questions at the end. Uh, sure. Okay, great. Let's do that because then we can. Uh, then I can finish on time, and if we go a couple minutes late for questions. That, okay. that'll be good. Great. Okay, now the next thing we want to look at, you know, is a function query. Now, the idea of a function query is that you take a query and you parameterize it to make it reusable. So let's look at a scenario. Okay, so let's say that, um, you know, here, I want a function query. And earlier, I kind of showed you the code to kind of clean text. But now what's going to happen is when you want to create a function query, you really just open the advanced editor and you put a parameter list of one or more parameters, input as text, and then you use the arrow. And then you can just have the let statement afterwards. So the idea is that this is a reusable uh, function. You know, so let's go down here and I've got comments. And so what I'd like to do is let's go to column. You know, let's go to invoke custom function. And so this will be something like, uh, you know, cleaned, uh, you know, comments. And so what do we want to do? We want to call the function query called clean text. What do I want to pass? I want to pass this comment to it. You know, so the idea is that now I can go and start stripping characters out. You know, so the idea of clean text, you know, is that you'll create a reusable piece you know, of M logic that you can reuse, you know, across many different queries in this project. And you could also, you know, take the same function query and use it other places. 
You know, so it just kind of gives you a way to modularize and reuse your functions. You know, so once again, creating the function query, it's as easy as creating the query at first and then opening up the advanced editor and basically adding a parameter up top. And then somewhere, you know, inside, um, you know, you also, um, you know, have to use the parameter. And what I mean by that is that, you know, you have a parameter defined here, yeah, but you really have to use the parameter somewhere, you know, in the query function, you know, for it to have some particular effect. Okay. And you've kind of seen me walk through and, you know, once you've created the function query, you know, being able to call it to basically do some processing uh, on a column. Okay, we're into the home stretch now. So let me get through this section once again, and then we'll take, you know, all the questions that we can. So the last thing we're going to look at is designing query parameters. You know, so what is a query parameter? Some people call them data set parameters, you know, kind of the same thing. You know, but the idea is that parameters which change between different projects, you know, can be added, you know, at the query level or PBX project level. Now, when you want to create a new parameter, you have to go to the, um, you know, the, uh, <clears throat> the Power Query window. You know, you'll see that if you're at the other window, you can't create parameters from here. You have to come here, and then you're going to be able to open up the Manage Parameters and start adding parameters inside there. Now, when we add parameters, you know, the idea is, let's say that I added a parameter name state. And once I add a parameter name state, I can, if I don't want to write M code directly, you know, there are ways that you can reference the parameters uh, just in many of the dialogues that the Power Query designer has, um, you know, but also, you know, we can use them directly in code. You know, so if you have a parameter, you know, you can use those values directly. You know, so for instance, you know, let's say that I had uh, parameters for the database name, the database server, you know, and the state. You know, so those are common examples of why you'd have parameters. And the idea is that I have a generic database and 100 of my customers have the same database. So I'd like to create a project that once I push it up into the service, I can just go change the parameter values to point to a different database and maybe do some different filtering. And these parameters can be updated in the service, or they can also be updated uh, through PowerShell or through the Power BI service REST API. So they give us a lot of flexibility. Another thing that not everybody knows about is that if you create a parameter, you can actually use it, you know, inside of a report, you know, in, or inside of DAX. And what I mean by that is, you know, let's kind of see a simple example. Let's say I go back here, we go to manage parameters, uh, and then I have something like, uh, you know, report name. And what is this going to be? When you create parameters, don't leave them as any, you know, strongly type them. Uh, and now we have, you know, my uh, report uh, title. And now that you've done that, I'm going to go down to this query right here. I'm going to right click on it. And note that when you create a query, enable load is set to true by default, and you have to turn it off if you don't want it. Parameters is the opposite. Enable load is automatically disabled. But if I create a parameter and I call enable load, and now I go and push it inside here, what you're going to see is, hey, there's the report name. And now I can do something, you know, like take a card uh, and put that, you know, report name uh, on that particular card, you know, and maybe I'd uh, go ahead and, you know, swap that uh, out so it doesn't need a uh, category in place right there. You know, and the idea is that now I can go back, you know, to the parameter settings uh, and set that to, you know, my other uh, report title. And once I do that and apply the changes, you know, we should be able to see sometimes it takes two refreshes, you know, before you actually see the changes there, uh, you know, but now you can kind of see that once you create parameters, you can use them in your M code, you can use them in your DAX code, you can service them on your reports. Okay, one more topic here, and we got to go quick. So once you create templates, or once you create parameters, sometimes it makes sense to create a project file. So let me show you one more example. So 
there's three examples. And the one I want to show right here is the PBIT file. The idea of a PBIT file is that you have a parameterized project and then you export it as a PBIT file. So it's not useful in and of itself. We use it to create new projects. So when I open this right here, the way I've designed this is that you can pick which NFL team you want. And so when you open it and it has parameters and they're basically creating a PBIX file from a PBIT file, it then you know, is going to make you pick a team. You know, so let's say that I picked the Buccaneers. And now we'll go ahead. And now from the logic I have, it's able to find the home page you know, for that particular uh, team. It has a roster. It extracts the data. OK, now this one, I'm going to bring up this view right here and just kind of show that you know, this is just a uh, for people that really want to get their heads wrapped around how to design with M, you know, what you can see here is that I have things like um, the uh, team details. Uh, I have the teams themselves. You know, so here's an example where I just kind of hard coded, you know, every uh, team, you know, and also, you know, the HTML file, you know, for each of these teams. And then what happens is that we have a parameter value. And if I come back here and we kind of take a look at the parameter window, we just have one parameter, you know, which is team. And I've created a list. And once you create a team list, you can use that. And once again, you know, this is not a table of one column, it's a list. And so what's kind of neat about this is that if I go back here to manage parameters, you know, I can say I would like a list, what type I want to take this list. And so now that's how we were able to give them a choice, you know, and then once they pick that, you know, what you can see here is for the team details, you know, given the fact that you've picked a team, I can now go and kind of pick things up from other things inside. And then we have, you know, something that is going to, you know, actually do the, uh, you know, extraction, you know, from the individual table. You know, so once again, you know, what I'm trying to show with that demo, you know, is how you can create parameters. And then what gets to be common is to kind of parameterize the project so you can create many different PBX files that use the exact same data model, query logic, and report. We just swap out one or more parameters, you know, to point them to a different database or filter a different set of rows. Okay. And that's what takes us to the end of our session. Yay. So now, Miss Kay, if you would. <laughs> we have some um, questions. Thanks. That was amazing. Um, we do have some questions from people and we have I'm new to this. So is this something, is there something I should know before learning about query folding? That might have been contextual of it was asked at a certain time. Well, okay. query folding was one of the things that we taught here today. You know, I think as you learn about Power Query, you know, even whether you're digging into the M code or not, you know, you should understand the basics of query folding if you're going against regular SQL databases. You know, if you're pulling back data from an Excel workbook, you know, there is no query folding. You know, so depending on your data source, if your data source supports query folding and you need to write queries that are efficient, you know, you certainly, you know, need to know the concepts. Okay, awesome. Any tips? Um, oh, do both have the same performances? So basically, should we do the query folding in the applied steps or move all of it in um, SQL? Like, do both have the same performance? Well, in general, you know, I think the creators of Power Query really don't want you writing SQL. They want you using their tool and giving them the freedom to write you know, what they feel is the most optimal SQL. And, you know, the exact same query when it was run last year versus today versus next year might result in very different SQL. Um, okay. You know, so there are some situations, situations where they have a report and they have some SQL statement that, you know, somebody has been writing and maintaining, you know, over 10 years and there's no way we could redo this in M. You know, those are typically the situations where I just take the big, SQL statement that the ID department gave us and we put in and we get the data back in the right shape. You know, so it's not a sin. You know, I think each case, you know, 
you know, you should, you should make a judgment of whether, you know, SQL statements in there is, you know, reasonable or not, you know, but in general, I would start without using SQL. And then if you want to use it, you have to kind of justify, uh, you know, why it makes sense. Okay, we are at time. And is there a place where people can contact you for the rest of their uh, questions? Yeah, I think the uh, at Ted Patterson, uh, my Twitter handle is fine. D P A T I or P A T T I S O N. Okay, Twitter. Okay, I think we're going to call it um, right now. Thank you so much again, Ted, for another exciting, exciting, fabulous, informative session. We look forward to next month's. And please um, look at the Power Platform and um, Power Platform YouTube channel. And under Power BI because we'll be posting those by about uh, Tuesday or Wednesday next week, the entire series. And we look forward to seeing you next month. And Daniel, our producer, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. And thank you, Kelly. Appreciate it.